Hello everybody and good evening. My name is Don Arleth and welcome to our main edition of World News Tonight, coming to you live from Warsaw here on TVP World. So are we supposed to agree to bomb Moscow? Asked the Italian Deputy Prime Minister. There's still no agreement on the use of Western weapons supplied to Ukraine to attack targets on Russian territory. Even though Russia attacks Ukraine almost every day with long-range weapons. That's coming up in just a bit, but first off, let's take a look at tonight's headlines. Germany resumes deportations to Afghanistan. This is the first such case since the Taliban took power in 2021. Polish police take down the biggest synthetic opioid laboratory on EU soil. In the UK, employees could work longer hours over fewer days under one of the government's latest proposals. The leader of the main Polish opposition party, Law and Justice, announced a fundraiser today to keep his group afloat. The Conservative Party has already lost millions of euro in funding, but it also stands to lose all of its state subsidies for the next three years. That's the result of yesterday's ruling by the National Electoral Commission, which found irregularities in the party's financial reports. The Law and Justice Party has 14 days to appeal the decision of the National Electoral Commission to the Supreme Court. Every day the final ruling gets delayed. The Conservative camp can't properly prepare for the 2025 presidential election campaign. The situation has become so dire that the party has launched a fundraiser. Law and Justice leader Jarosław Kaczyński spurred no harsh words towards the current administration. If they win the presidential election as well, they will be able to do anything they want. With their bills, they can bring about an actual autocracy and dictatorship. But harsh rhetoric can sometimes be a double-edged sword. Donations for the party can't contain any offensive slurs, which was emphasized multiple times during the press conference. We already had instances where we received donations titled for the fight against Donald Tusk's regime. This can't happen. We have to send back such donations. When we asked the law and justice officials about the concrete evidence of financial irregularities presented by the Electoral Commission, they responded by saying that they were treated unfairly. Prime Minister Donald Tusk has a different view on the matter. It's difficult to expect a different outcome with a mountain of damning evidence. But it's not only a Polish problem. If there is a government which everybody knew was doing malicious things and it holds no responsibility for it after it loses power, then democracy as a whole suffers. The National Electoral Commission argued on Thursday that the Law and Justice Party used public funds to boost its political campaign before the parliamentary elections in 2023. While members of the Conservative opposition call it a targeted attack, this is not the first time the Electoral Commission rejected a financial report of a political party. Both the Polish People's Party and the Democratic Left Alliance lost all or some of their state subsidies before. In less than 24 hours, the Law and Justice Party managed to gather more than 100,000 euro through its fundraiser. If it were to lose all of its state subsidies, it would become the biggest political party in Poland to ever do so. But we are still waiting for the final decision of the National Electoral Commission, which should come in about a month. From the Polish capital, Kazimierz Wyszak, TVP World. Ukrainian forces have advanced further into Russia's Kursk region, but what might hurt Moscow more are Ukraine's expanding strikes deep behind the front lines. Here's more in this next report. While the offensive operations in the Donbas and in Kursk have largely stalled, Ukraine and Russia are striking each other's rears. A Russian attack against the city of Sumy, near the area of the Ukrainian incursion into Russian territory, killed two and injured a further 11 overnight. Ukrainian forces, in turn, are continuing their long-range bombardment campaign focused on oil infrastructure. The oil depot in Kamensk in Russia's Rostov region is on fire for the third day in a row. The Ukrainian command has reported continued progress in the Kursk region. The advances are relatively minor compared to what was seen in the early days of the operation. Additionally, while advancing in Kursk, Ukraine is losing ground in the Donbass on the approach to the city of Pokrovsk. 
The offensive operation in the Kursk direction continues. Our forces have advanced up to two kilometers in the past day. They took control of five square kilometers of territory. The situation in other directions remains difficult but controlled. While the war is raging in Ukraine, European countries are ramping up their military spending in order to be better prepared for a possible conflict in the future. Polish Defense Minister Władysław Kosiniak-Kamysz has traveled to Washington, where he discussed the conflict in Ukraine with U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. And the United States and Poland, along with our allies and partners, stand together for a free and sovereign Ukraine. Poland has shown exceptional leadership on Ukraine, including providing vital logistics support and substantial security assistance. That has helped Ukraine defend itself against the Kremlin's assault. Kosiniak Kamesh emphasized the pace at which the Polish armed forces are modernizing. NATO has been pushing its member states to ramp up their defense spending to 2% of GDP, with many still beneath this threshold. What is more, Poland fulfills NATO obligations well beyond the requirements. We spend more than 4% of our GDP on defense, Next year it will be 4.7. This is the first place of the all NATO's countries and uh, we are really happy for that. We have to be ready to defend our territory and NATO's eastern flank. That is why we continue intensive programs dedicated to the modernization of the Polish armed forces by acquiring state-of-the-art U.S. military equipment. <laughs> the situation in Ukraine was also discussed at the meeting of the EU foreign ministers. Kyiv is pushing for permission to use long-range missiles provided by the West against Russian territory. Italian Deputy Prime Minister Antonio Tajani has publicly voiced his opposition to such a permission, citing caution in angering Moscow too much. His view appears to be shared by many in Brussels, as a decision such as the one the Ukrainians want does not appear to be forthcoming. For the first time since the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin for war crimes committed in Ukraine, the Russian president will be flying to a country that is a member of the ICC, Mongolia. The visit will take place next week. Now let's go to Kyiv and our correspondent there, Oz Katerji, who has more. Hello, Oz. Uh, now, it looks like uh, Mongolia is required to arrest Vladimir Putin, but it sounds like there is an agreement in place which makes this not the case. What do we know? That's correct. Uh, a spokesperson for the International Criminal Court uh, speaking to the BBC earlier today reiterated that uh, and said that uh, Ulaanbaatar is obligated to cooperate with the ICC's arrest warrant uh, and that it is expected to execute the court's decision. Uh, however, uh, I do not feel that uh, Moscow would be confident in uh, pronouncing this trip uh, if they thought there was any danger of the Mongolian authorities uh, actually executing an arrest warrant against him. Now, uh, Putin was indicted on war crimes charges uh, in March 2023 uh, for the crime of uh, unlawful deportation of Ukrainian children. Um, and ever since then, Putin has not been able to travel to uh, any countries that have signed the Rome uh, statute. And, and that's, that's the ICC's uh, founding document. So any country that is signed up to the Rome statute uh, is obligated to uh, order the arrest of uh, Putin if he enters their territory. This is a real test uh, for the ICC, for the international system. Uh, and for Mongolia, really, for Mongolian democracy, uh, if the Mongolian authorities are not prepared to uh, cooperate with this decision, uh, then it appears that the uh, judiciary in, in Mongolia is being uh, thwarted from carrying out its lawful orders under the country's own constitution for signing uh, the ICC in Rome statute in the first place. So, um, interesting one. Uh, we do know that Putin was uh, unable to visit South Africa uh, last year, uh, a fellow BRICS uh, member, because of the uh, arrest warrant out for him, uh, which goes to show that South African, uh, the South African judiciary is not under the control uh, of the president, uh, who is a known Putin ally. So big questions uh, for the international community. 
uh, and all eyes on Tuesday in Ulaanbaatar for Putin's uh, supposed arrival. Uh, we'll see whether that takes place or not next week. All right, Oz. Well, yeah, definitely an interesting one. I guess we'll have to keep our eyes peeled for all the developments there. Oz Katerji reporting from Kyiv. Thanks. Thank you very much for your report. Earlier today, a report surfaced that Ukraine would, in fact, extend its gas transit of Russian oil though, through its territories, although a Mikhailo Podolyak, an aide to the Ukrainian, excuse me, Ukrainian president Volodymyr Zelensky, suggested that Ukraine would end the transit agreement. Since then, he has backtracked on his previous statement. According to his latest statement, Ukraine will honor all contracts for oil transit to the European Union. Some of them will remain valid until 2029. Previously, Podolyak said that Ukraine could possibly stop the transit of Russian oil through the Druzhba pipeline as early as January of 2025. The head of the Ukrainian oil and gas group Naftogaz, Oleksiy Chernyshov, also said that Ukraine remains a reliable partner for EU countries and will continue to fulfill their contractual obligations under the current gas and oil transportation contracts. A Kabul-bound flight left Germany earlier today, taking 28 Afghan nationals convicted of crimes in Germany back to their home country. This is the first time in that Germany has done so in three years and also comes as the anti-immigration far-right party AFD, or Alternative for Germany, is set to have a historic victory during the upcoming elections in two major German states. Germany has resumed deportations of criminals of Afghan nationality to their home country. This is a clear sign that anyone who commits criminal offenses can expect to be deported. Germany had ceased deportations to Afghanistan after the Taliban took over the country in 2021. Schulz's announcement comes just two days ahead of an important regional election in which the anti-immigration far-right AFD party is projected to come out on top in at least one of the two states. The current German government, uh, the uh, traffic light coalition of Social Democrats, Greens and Liberals, has failed on many fronts to deliver results and that led to a sort of desperation and uh, dissatisfaction by many citizens. The AFD is running on a platform of anti-immigration, anti-EU policies and has proposed an exit referendum should it ever come to power in the federal government. AFD politicians quickly seized the narrative on the knife attack in Solingen last week, using it to further propel its anti-immigrant rhetoric. Voters from minority communities across Germany worry about the consequences an AFD victory could bring. The AFD is an anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim and anti-democratic party, a party that denies fascism, denies the Holocaust. I'm afraid that at some point people won't be able to tell the difference, good or bad, you're just a foreigner, even if you have a German passport. That's what worries me personally. The AFD is currently leading the polls in Thuringia and is going neck and neck with the centrist CDU party in Saxony. Even though the party is unlikely to be able to form a state government, experts warn that an AFD victory could have a significant impact on Germany and Europe as a whole. Serbia has signed a contract for the purchase of French fighter jets. The deal was reached during President Emmanuel Macron's visit to Belgrade. The French president was rece re received with military honors. As critics say, Paris put European values on the back burner to sign lucrative contracts. For Serbia's Air Force, a new chapter is opening, a chapter which has been made in France. Belgrade is getting 12 Rafale fighter jets for almost 3 billion euro. Serbia's choice of Rafale fighter jets is in this regard a clear decision, one of a long-term alliance between our two countries within a stronger and more sovereign Europe. This choice contributes to our strategic autonomy and strengthens it. 
Serbia and France signed 11 deals in total during the visit. These are contracts and statements of intent in areas such as agriculture, education, healthcare, mining and nuclear energy. Through its partnership with France, Serbia wants to get closer to the EU. I thanked President Macron for the support that France provided to Serbia on the path to EU accession, and I am convinced that we will have that support in the future as well. Belgrade has been a candidate to join the bloc since 2012. Serbia has not been progressing uh, on its EU path uh, over the, the past years and according to uh, many analysts, uh, researchers, uh, civil society, but also uh, independent experts, um, basically Serbia's track record uh, on uh, EU-related reforms has been decreasing rather than, than increasing. The Serbian opposition is optimistic about the blooming relations with France, but has nonetheless been critical of President Macron's approach. This. Um latest uh, amicability and friendship between two of them is actually a good uh, cover curtain for Vucic to to put push aside all the wrong things that his regime has been doing. They are jointly push, pushing aside the rule of law, the freedom of the media, the autocratic tendencies that in Serbia now are overwhelming. Serbia is one of the few European countries to still have good relations with Moscow despite Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Recently, however, the Serbian administration has made a series of moves aimed at repairing its ties with the EU. On one hand, no sanctions against the Kremlin, on the other, extensive deals with EU countries. Whether they will get Belgrade closer to EU membership remains to be seen. For now, though, it looks like this gamble is paying off for Serbia. From Belgrade for TVP World, Ovidius Nicea. Poland's ruling coalition has introduced new guidelines for Polish health professionals and prosecutors regarding women's access to abortion. Under the proposed rules, hospitals in the country could face fines up to nearly 120,000 euro if they create obstacles to accessing medical assistance for certain pregnancy termination procedures under certain circumstances. Polish abortion law, tightened in 2020 under the Law and Justice government, has made it one of the most restrictive in the EU, second only to Malta. As a consequence, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women critically assessed the current law. Poland violated women's rights by unduly restricting access to abortion, according to the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Many women were forced to carry unwanted pregnancies to term, seek unsafe clandestine procedures or travel abroad for legal abortions. The current government's proposal aims to significantly ease Polish women's access to safe abortions. We cannot win a majority in the same, but we have decided to change the reality within the framework of the law, which will remain in force for some time. Under the current guidelines, a single relevant medical opinion should be sufficient for an abortion. The law does not specify what kind of doctor with what specialization can issue such a certificate. It only says that this doctor should have a specialization relevant to the pregnant woman's illness. Consequently, the recognition of a threat to a woman's health, including mental health, is sufficient for a legal abortion, with the current law not requiring the threat to be immediate or exceptionally severe. Should a medical facility that has an agreement with the National Health Fund create obstacles for a woman with a binding medical opinion, the ministry can impose a selection of severe penalties on that facility. Polish police have cracked down on the largest opioid factory in Europe producing fentanyl, potentially saving the lives of more than 4 million people. The operation involves services from the European Union and Ukraine, with a special police unit busting the factory filled with professional equipment and large-scale production lines. Opioids and their synthetic counterparts are medicines that are prescribed to treat persistent or severe pain. Upon injection, the medicine travels through the bloodstream, later attaching to opioid receptors in the human brain, soothing pain and amplifying pleasure. Their effects are many times stronger than morphine and are extremely cheap to produce. Okay, okay. He's smoking. Oh, okay, he's coming back. He's coming out of it. It is no wonder that people chasing an inexpensive high would latch onto substances like fentanyl or methadone. Unfortunately, those same substances are highly addictive, and administering a deadly dose is much easier than many expect. 
This is exactly why the Polish police are determined to keep their country and the European Union safe from the opioid epidemic. In one of the biggest operations of its kind, the Polish Central Police Investigation Bureau, Counter-Narcotics Department of the National Police of Ukraine, the Polish National Persecution Office, Europol and Polish counter-terrorist units combined forces to crack down on the biggest synthetic opioid lab in the European Union. Thanks to our amazing cooperation with the national prosecution, the people who engage in these types of crimes in Poland will not be allowed to feel safe in our country. These people have been temporarily detained and for now will remain behind bars. Police reports say that 195 kilograms of crystal methadone, 153 kilograms of alpha PVP, 430 liters of various drugs in liquid form, and countless amounts of narcotic persecutors and chemical substances used in the production of synthetic opioids were seized by the law enforcement. According to their calculations, just the completed drugs were capable of giving upwards of 4 million people across the European Union a deadly overdose. Synthetic opioids, most of all fentanyl, have spread like wildfire across the world over the last few years. As of 2023, they were responsible for over 70,000 deaths in the US alone, with much more unaccounted for in other parts of the world. How long do you think this goes for? There could be changes coming to employment rules in the United Kingdom. Under the new government plans, workers would be able to request a four-day week while still working the same hours as stated in their contract. Our UK correspondent Claudia Trevinska has more on the story. Flexible working hours and a four-day week. This could be the new reality under the new government plan pushed by Deputy Prime Minister Angela Reiner, who wants to introduce the legislation this autumn after thorough consultations with businesses and unions. Employees in the UK already have the right to request flexible working, but it is easy for employers to refuse their requests. Once the change would be introduced, this could be due to change as well. So far, the government has denied that it will force employers to allow the four-day week. However, this has not made business owners any less uneasy about the prospect of having to grant this right to their workers. According to a spokesperson for the Department for Business and Trade, the move is designed to, I quote, improve workers' rights and boost their productivity, while supporting the businesses that pay people's wages. From London for TVP World, I'm Claudia Czerwinska. And now we are going to discuss all the latest threads from the war in Ukraine. And simultaneously going on right now is the GlobeSec Security Conference. And joining us from that conference is Maria Mezenseva, Ukrainian MP from Servant of the People Party. Hello and thank you very much for joining me on World News Tonight. Thank you for having me. So we're very curious to hear uh, the latest developments from the GlobeSec conference uh, concerning all these events that have been unfolding throughout the week and beyond uh, from the war in Ukraine. Uh, so what are the most significant developments on that end? So the forum kicked off today in the afternoon with a very symbolic topic that Europe and the whole world is going through sort of a storm in every dimension, in energy dimension, financial dimension, warfare and security and defense, of course. And in some ways, it also triggers the humanitarian crisis. So today, in my home city, Kharkiv, during my speech here at the forum, uh, Russian rockets attacked a peaceful settlement, basically a multi-storage building uh, in one of the neighborhoods, leaving at least 40 wounded with four killed, among them a child. And uh, uh, still the, um, the services, the emergency services are on the ground trying to fight the fires, which means that Russia is, continue, uh, is continuing to use such symbolic moments, one of the largest defense and security conference, which is GlobSec, to uh, target civilians, to test our air defense, and to show that they are not eager to stop committing mass war crimes. Of course, uh, here at the conference, um, we are speaking about 
several future elections that are coming, including in the U.S., how it may shift uh, or change the support. Uh, we're talking about the fact, and that was also said and confirmed by President Pavel, that the self-defense and security system of Europe has to grow and develop and be reliant relying on uh, itself, of course, with the cooperation with the NATO allies, but it has to be enriched. We spoke at one of the sessions about the drones warfare uh, in a good sense, in a positive uh, sense, uh, where we can actually um, talk about the new developments, but the same drones on the Russian side, which are designed, for instance, in Iran, uh, are targeted still, all Shahids are targeting still the uh, peaceful, um, peaceful uh, civilians in Ukraine. And also hospitals, schools and other facilities. Energy is one of other important topics which we have discussed. And this is the only way to diversify risks with regards to um, gas supplies, less dependence, for instance. Austria is still struggling to decrease its own dependence on Russian gas. Romania on its own supports the diversification and uh, more um, export to EU states. Well, Ukraine has exported electricity itself in the beginning of the full scale where we joined EU electricity markets. However, now we are referring more to the import. We are expecting a very severe winter if shellings like this, like the one you see from Kharkiv on your screen right now, would continue. Kharkiv was quite peaceful for the last, you know, I would say, months. You know, shortly after we celebrated City Day, 370 years, and Independence Day, Russian forces reactivated their operation. Of course, we also spoke about Kursk region and sort of buffer zone created there because we're still awaiting, our armed forces are still awaiting for the restrictions of using long-range missiles to be lifted up. We're right. talking about storm shadow, other kids. But you know, for this, which you see right now on your screen, not to happen, we need more air defense. And that's what we will lobby together with our delegation here in Block Second Prague. Certainly. What is the, you know, from your perspective, what has the reaction been to the Kursk incursion? Uh, I know that it's kind of raising alarms in the United States and among certain political circles, uh, but I was wondering how the, some of the Europeans are reacting to this. I, I don't think Europe is so opposed as some may be in the United States. And concerning those red lines uh, for the use of long-range weapons, uh, is, there, is there talk? Are they trying to find solutions to allow Ukraine to go ahead and use these weapons to their advantage? Uh, yes, uh, but my observation is a little bit different. We have received the representatives of the both chambers, Senate and the House of Representatives, actually sent from, from both Republicans and Democrats, sending a very clear message that they are, and I'm citing, fascinated, amused, they couldn't believe their eyes of what has happened, because seriously, it's the first time since Second World War foreign troops actually uh, marched and entered uh, the territory of Russia. Uh, well, for Russia itself, it was a huge surprise for the rest of the world. Believe me, for us politicians as well, because unlike the last year's campaign, and you remember with the citation of uh, the, the very much awaited deoccupation campaign, etc. This one was very secret, I would say top secret. Not many people or a few people knew about it in Ukraine. And uh, we are expanding. Uh, Ukrainian armed forces are not forgetting about civilians, Russians who are left on the ground. And unlike what Russia has done to our temporary deoccupied territories, they were raping people, looting uh, private property, killing. Um, deporting civilians, children, and taking uh, them hostages, but also that created for us a, uh, an opportunity to show to the world but that we are completely different. Our army is helping civil Russian civilians on the ground. We had on, on Independence Day a huge swap 
of prisoners of war. You remember a formula of President Zelensky for peace, the meeting, peace, peace summit meeting in Switzerland was dedicated to the swap of prisoners of war, to bring back all deported children and to uh, take back all civilians who are kept illegally hostage. So I think this forum, other forums, can serve a purpose to call yet again for international law to be operational. With regards to what we are seeing or expecting in the future days with our uh, American partners, NATO allies, we really expect this map that President Zelensky and head of the office, uh, Mr. Yermak, spoke about. So the targets that are being, uh, being developed to be targeted at the Russian territory, like oil refineries and others, which are feeding by money this uh, brutal war, only them will be presented on the map. And I think you've seen some politicians in the U.S. already showed it publicly, saying, look, this long range will target this, this and that. It's not targeting schools, hospitals of children with cancer, like, like Russians were doing in their case, but rather completely different, which serves again a commitment to international law purposes, because we are using our right to defend ourselves. Absolutely. And, uh, well, I hope that uh, more decisive decisions can be made uh, coming up as uh, the use of those long-range weapons will uh, really help Ukrainian armed forces uh, continue to expand their operations uh, and get on really favorable terms if it comes to any possible negotiations. Well, Maria Mezintseva, Ukrainian MP from Servant of the People's Party, thank you very much for joining us on World News tonight. And that concludes this edition of the program. Thank you for watching and stay with us for more here on TVP World.